Welcome to my lecture online. The more we learn about nature, physics, the universe, the more we realize how complex everything is. So when we began to understand that there were atoms, and then we began to understand that the atoms were structured with a nucleus at the center, which contained the neutrons and the protons, and then we had the electrons rolling around the nucleus, well, that became more complicated, but we could handle that. We thought that the electrons were just simple point objects, and we believe that still is the case. And we thought that maybe protons and neutrons were also the simplest form of matter in point objects, or very, very tiny objects. But then there were some things that just, just didn't seem to balance out. And we had some trouble with understanding the spin of the protons, which if they were point objects, they would be different. And we then realized, well, wait a minute, when we start taking uh, these particles and put them in accelerators and we have them collide at very high speeds and all of a sudden something happens and we began to discover that protons and neutrons are actually made up of even smaller particles called quarks. Now the original model was that a proton was made out of three quarks, two ups and one down, and we found that the charge property of the quarks was that the up quarks had a positive charge of two-thirds and the down quark had a negative charge of minus one-third. When you add all those up, they add up to plus one and that was indeed the case for a proton. The proton has a plus one charge, so all that began to fit pretty well. For a neutron, it turns out there's two downs and one up, so one plus two-thirds and two negative one-thirds added together is a neutral charge and so neutrons were neutrally charged. And so a neutron consisted of two downs and one up and all of a sudden things began to again coalesce into something that made sense. But then there's a problem here if we look at a proton and we look at the two up quarks they both have a positive two-third charge and even though there's a, a single negative charge of minus one-third the repulsive forces of these up quarks really would kind of make them fly apart. They shouldn't be sticking together. So we knew there had to be something in there that would keep them together. And then when we continued to do experiments with even more powerful accelerators, we began to see an additional par particle come out of the collision. And we figured that must be the thing we were looking for, which is called the gluons. Gluons that glue the quarks together to prevent them from flying outward. And so now we had a nice little package that seemed to make sense. But then with additional experimentation and really going to the limits of high pressure and temperature, we began to realize that when we subject protons and neutrons to very high temperatures and very high pressures, we would have this plasma of gluons and quarks coming out of the, uh, the collisions. And by studying this more, we began to realize it's not the simple model. What's really happening is that the two up and uh, the two up and one down quark, well, they're constantly moving at very high speeds throughout the proton, and there's a ton of gluons in there, many, many gluons holding things together, but constantly moving and changing. And the gluons sometimes will split up in what we call virtual quarks. So we'll have a a quark and an anti-quark, a down and an anti-down, an up and an anti-up, a charm and an anti-charm. Yes, there are quarks named charms. The charm, there's actually six different quarks, an up and down, a strange, a charm, a top and a bottom. Just means there's six different quarks with six different masses. And, uh, and, and they would be constantly moving and the virtual course would come into existence momentarily and then disappear again. And, and so we see this whirling mass of, of, of uh, movement of quarks and gluons. And what the gluons are actually doing is they're actually providing the glue, that's why they're called gluon, to keep all that together. It turns out that protons are extremely stable particles. We have never seen a proton disintegrate into anything else. Once a proton is formed, a proton remains a proton, unless you're physically able to smash it under very high temperatures and pressure. That's the only way you can destroy a proton. Now, another very strange thing about protons is that if we add up the masses of the quarks that make up a proton, notice we have an up quark at a mass of 2.2 million electron volts divided by c square. That's kind of a strange unit for mass, but notice since we have E equals mc square, m is equal to E over c square, so energy divided by c square represents mass. So for the up quark, we have a mass 
a mass equivalent of 2.2 MeV per C squared, and the mass of a down quark is 4.7 MeV per C squared. Those are not exact values because we still don't know the exact mass, but those are pretty close. So two of these plus one of these adds up to about 9 million electron volts per C squared. That's only 1% of the total mass of a proton. Somehow, these three particles with these minute masses make up a particle with 100 times the mass. Wow, we really can't explain that one yet. That's still one of those big mysteries. We think it has something to do with the energy contained within the gluons. The gluons represent the nuclear strong force, the, st the force strong enough to prevent these charged particles, which are actually really, really close together, from just flying off into space at very high speeds of the enormous repulsive forces. And that's not happening because the gluons represent nuclear strong force are even stronger than the electrical repulsive forces. Turns out that the estimate is about 137 times. We know it's at least over 100 times as strong as the electrical repulsive forces keeping everything inbound. What we also realize is that these gluons they kind of act like springs. And so when the quarks start getting close to the boundary of the proton, the strings strengthen and the force increases, preventing them from escaping and eventually get pulled in. So even though there's lots of motion and movement and vibration, those particles can only go so far before the, the gluon forces, the nuclear strong force, arrest their motion and brings them back in control. And as we've told you already, in nature, that never goes wrong. They always stay within the confines of the proton. It also seems from experimentation that when you put atoms together or nuclei together closely, that these or not just, no, I shouldn't say nuclei, I think I'm wrong there. When you put, when you look at the nucleus and you have protons and neutrons close together, these gluons within the neutrons and the protons are actually able to cross boundaries and interact with one another. Another reason why a nucleus, which again is made up of positive charges, the positive protons and neutrons in very close proximity, the reason why they remain together because a nucleus shouldn't stay together. These protons should just shoot out like, like bullets out of a gun because they repel each other with this enormous force. But it's the gluon interaction between proton and proton and proton and neutron that keeps them locked together in a tight bunch. Now we will also see in perhaps some future video that when these nuclei become too big, they don't always stay together. That's when we have nuclear decay. And the reason is because these nuclear strong forces only act over very, very short distances. And once things come, become too far apart, these gluons don't seem to be capable of holding the nucleus together. Hence the radioactive nuclei, and that's the result of the limitations of the nuclear strong force. That's why we have nuclear power. That's why we have energy to mass conversion. So it all makes sense in the long run, as to see everything is, there's a reason for everything. But now we all of a sudden realize that protons, which used to be these simple little positive charge objects, are very, very complicated. Not only are there six different quarks, and of course we have the six different antiquarks. For every quark there's an antiquark, so there's a total of 20, uh, 12 quarks. We also have eight different gluons, and we have three different colors. Now, the reason why we call them colors is because it's hard to keep track of things, but the colors represent properties that produce forces. So there's three different kinds of forces acting between the gluons, or that the gluons utilize to, to produce the nuclear strong force, and there's eight different gluons, each with its own different property. Now we won't go into the details of that yet, that's much more complicated, but you can see that that nice little model that we used to have about atoms and nuclear structure all of a sudden has become way more complicated. But as we're delving into the secrets of this, we begin to realize that, wow, this is why. This is why a nuclear stayed together. This is why a proton is so stable. It's quite interesting and quite amazing when you think about the structure of these simple atoms. They're not so simple anymore.